Uh, our next panelist, who you may know simply as JP, uh, is an attorney here in DC by day, and he's managing editor of japersrink.com by night, uh, which is the longest running Washington Capitals blog on the internet, founded in June of 2005, and has grown from a one-man operation to a site that boasts the work of some of the brightest minds in the hockey blogosphere, one of which you'll hear later today, and a vibrant online community, so please give it up for John Press. And our final panelist uh, found the writing of Bill James in the early 1990s and started using advanced analytics to get an edge in his fantasy baseball league. But since then, he's used those same principles to write about all sports, including hockey. Um, he started out with the local Caps blog, Russian Machine Never Breaks. Um, and now he's signed on full time with the Washington Post uh, plus ESPN. And he's the co-host of the only hockey radio show in D.C., Crashing the Net on 106.7 The Fan, Saturdays at 9 a.m., uh, please introduce, help me introduce Neil Greenberg. Micah when he comes back. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, the mics are a little hot, so people might have to hold them a little bit away from themselves and stuff. Um, so uh, before I forget, I also want to welcome people watching online, uh, which is great. Better? Okay. Um, so uh, I want to start out uh, with you guys by just talking a little about how you got involved in analytics in the first place. So maybe talk a little bit about where you first heard about some of the new fancy stats that are available, how you, how you first got interested, and how you got to this point. Uh, I would say, is that, is that uh, loud enough? I would say that uh, since I was a kid, I was more of a numbers-based guy, uh, right? I, I, I lived in Boston when uh, the Bruins were winning cups in the 1970, 72, uh, but I wasn't old enough to stay up and watch the whole game. So my dad, I'd go to bed after the second period. And my dad had strict orders that I wanted when I woke up in the morning to, to have a list of all the penalties, all the scoring for, for both sides. So that when I got up in the morning, I could add them to my little uh, ongoing chart and, you know, erase. I would sit and eat cereal before school and, and change the uh, Phil Esposito and Bobby Orr's goal and, uh, assist totals and stuff. So uh, I've always been numbers based, and uh, you know, you, you, I think you, you watch enough of any sport, and you start to wonder why things happen, and you want explanations for why things happen or don't happen. And anytime there's more information, uh, it's a good thing. And I, I think that around the late 1990s, when the NHL began to track things like block shots and hits. Um, I started, you know, they pass out these sheets at the end of every period. So I would start incorporating some of that stuff just into, without even realizing that, hey, you know, I mean, somewhere on a subconscious level, I think I was thinking, well, this team took 25 shots. The other team took 12. I mean, this team had the puck more. So I would just include that just sort of as, a, as an aside. And, uh, no, I wasn't smart enough to come up with anything like Horsey or Fenwick, but those things are, are good measurements. And, uh, you know, I, I just think it's uh, the, the, more, the more explanations we can have for things and the better we can, we can try to point out why things happen and value players and, and assess what has happened and what may happen in the future, I think, I think the better off we all are. Yeah, I'd say uh, similar to Mike, I grew up uh, a big sports fan, big numbers fan. Uh, and as I started writing the blog uh, back about 10 years ago, um, you know, you, you start wondering what's really happening, what's driving the results that we're seeing, uh, and the numbers become more available. Uh, and in the blogosphere itself, you know, you had guys come along like um, Gabe Desjardins or uh, Tyler Dello, and they just put out this really inspiring stuff that uh, makes you think about what's going on. You know, I, I distinctly remember 
the Caps run to the finals back uh, in 97. And uh, they were getting pretty uh, badly outshot often. But, you know, we were always saying to ourselves, well, they're keeping the shots to the outside. They're not dangerous shots. You know, just the, you know, the stuff that you hear today that you hear general managers and coaches talk about, um, but have since largely been debunked, you know, uh, by uh, the use of data, by the look at, uh, uh, at the analytics and everything. Uh, it just gives you a deeper view and dip, deeper appreciation and understanding of what you're actually seeing or, you know, in many cases, not even seeing. So I think that's sort of the goal, just a, a, a better understanding of what's actually going on versus, uh, you know, and there's something to be said for sitting back and just watching the game, and, you know, shutting your mind off to it. But there's, I mean, that's like sometimes like watching like a Michael Bay movie or something like, you know, you, it, it's like, it's cool if you want to, you know, sometimes you're not feeling like, you know, making your brain work real hard and uh, that, that's fine too sometimes. But uh, I think to get a better appreciation and understanding of what's actually happening and what's actually happened and probably most importantly, you know, what might happen in the future. Yeah, for, for me, can anyone hear me okay? For, for me, it was two things that happened simultaneously. One, I found Bill James writing. I remember finding the 1985 baseball abstract and like copying the stats from his book into my Excel spreadsheet for the Brock II projection system, which he had back then, and trying to follow it cell by cell. And, it, it didn't work out as, as well as you think. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, and then also, of all things, horse racing. I don't know if anyone knows who Andy Byer is, but that was like the first time I actually profited off of math in terms of seeing which horses were actually running fastest on different tracks. And I, I, and I kind of had the same feeling that, that JB had was, am I, is what I'm seeing actually happening? And more importantly, is it repeatable, right? And and for me, it was, can I make money off this? But in all seriousness, it was really looking at the performance that I'm seeing versus the performance that's actually taking place. And that started in baseball. And I mean, I, growing up, I was a huge baseball fan and started realizing that a lot of these same principles can be um, put to hockey. And that's when I started looking online and, and I found, like, like JB said, you know, you find behind the net, you find some other writers. And, uh, for me, it really did start with Japer Drink. I mean, it, that for me was one of the first stops and still is the first stop every morning looking at what they've done and, and trying to, to port the things that I learned from there to other sports and other teams and what have you. But yeah, I mean, it all comes down to are, is my, are my eyes tricking me? And really looking at performance and not so much to, to ruin the game for anybody else, but just I'm curious. I'm, I'm, I'm intellectually curious to try to figure out what's going to happen. And that's really where it all started for me. And it's been, it's been just a great ride ever since. Great. So I'm curious uh, also what sort of the public reaction has been to a lot of the work you guys have done using statistics uh, in your writing well, and how that's... Josh is here. He can probably... <laughs> <laughs> That's true too, but how, also how it's changed over the years. I mean, obviously you guys have been doing it for a long time and I'm sure at the beginning um, there was a lot more, uh, you know, criticism I would think or people say, you know, what are all these numbers about, but how has that changed over the years and where do you think, think it's going? I don't think it's changed for me. I, I, I'm not smart enough to come up with the stuff that JP comes up with, with the, the analytics type stuff. I just, you know, I'll drop in stuff that's, that's pretty uh, low level compared to it to what Neil and, and JP and a lot of you guys do. Um, I love reading. Uh, and, and if, and if I see something that, that really catches my eye or, you know, opens, uh, opens some, some vistas for me, then I'll retweet it or, you know, make a point of, of, uh, passing it along. But, um, you know, what I do day in and day out that relates to this is, is a, is a, a raindrop compared to what these guys do. So, well, I mean, for, for me, the goal has always been sort of to make, uh, to be informative, but still accessible to people of, uh, along the spectrum, wherever they're, you know, they are on their sort of analytics journey or whatever you might want to call it. Like, uh, you know, you, you don't want to get so deep in the weeds that, uh, 
that you lose people, but you also don't want to uh, dumb it down for people because people are, are smart enough to, to understand it, or if they're not, you know, maybe it's not their cup of tea. But um, so, so I would say that, that it's pretty much the goal is, uh, has been and it continues to be, you know, informing people without necessarily drowning them. And also, you know, what, what we do versus what, you know, some of these uh, young folks who've been grabbed up by teams are now doing is, you know, part of what we have to do is, is there's an entertainment aspect to it. And that um, sometimes, it, to be honest, it can be, you know, not necessarily what you want to do. You know, you may want to do the deep dive. You may want to get way down in it. And it's just not something that your audience would be interested in. And uh, so, you know, the, there are trade-offs and everything. And that's the, sort of the journalism aspect of it versus um, just the, the hard data uh, analytics aspect of it. Yeah. By a show of hands, how many of you have read Bill James' abstracts? Any one of them? Okay. So the same arguments that he got in the 80s is what hockey is getting right now. I mean, almost word for word. And that I don't think will ever stop. You'll always have people that embrace analytics. You'll always have people that don't. You'll have people that agree with you if you use no numbers, right? Some people will agree with you. Some people will don't. Some people won't. Um, it, I mean, I think it's become a lot. Uh, maybe either I'm numb to it now or it's just gotten a little bit less. People have been more accepting. But for the most part, it, people get afraid, I think, sometimes stuff that they don't understand. And it all depends on the language, too, right? I mean, if you went to 30 NHL coaches and asked them if puck possession is important, they'd all probably say yes. But if you ask them about Corsi in that same type of vein, they, they, they may not know what you're talking about, and they may say Corsi is stupid, right? I mean, that's, and that's really the key. And that goes back to what JP was saying as far as writing excessively so that people can understand it. That's the first step is – introducing people to what we do so that it makes sense to them and it's not just set in decimal places worth of numbers but but also in context of what they already know and that's been something that i've really been told to do at the washington post right i mean i i can't as much as i would love to go into these deep dives and like and and really look into stuff that interests me i, I do have a job to to bring the analytics to a mainstream audience and Sometimes I could do that a little bit of a time, but as far as opposition, you know, it, it depends on the day. It depends on what I'm writing about. I'm sure it depends on, on what you guys are writing about or, or even, you know, even with, with, with Mike, you know, in his writing, I'm sure that when he drops a Corsi reference, people get upset about that, right? I mean, because it's, it, it, at some point they think that maybe it has no place. I'm not guessing, but I'm just saying, I mean, there's, so there's always going to be people that are going to be upset that analytics are in the stuff that they're trying to read about. But I think by and large, especially after the summer of analytics, it's been a lot easier. And I think that's a lot, in a, in a lot of ways, it's like hockey generally, right? You have this niche sport, if you, I don't know if that term offends people here or, wh or what it does, but you know, you, you can choose to sort of hoard it and keep it to yourself, or you can try to make it uh, more accessible and expand uh, the audience and you know it's very much the same with with analytics and doing statistical analyses you can if you want you can keep it to the folks in this room you know you can write to this audience and not look to expand it but you know just like with hockey I think the more uh, the more people that you can reach out to and allow to enjoy it the more enjoyable it becomes for everybody yeah. and we saw that a little bit with some of the the, the like the election stuff that's been coming out recently right about how special this player is and how special of a season and just a career that we're seeing and and some people are like yeah you can talk about how special it is but don't put it in the Gretzky Lemieux category or even you know any of the other type of great players that they know but I mean that's that's what analytics does when you start to uh, put stuff in context it makes people uncomfortable because they're they Either they're unwilling to admit that maybe things have changed or they're just not ready to give up some of the stuff that they had since their childhood. I know, um, you know, I'm probably a little bit in that way in some respects, but by and large, you know, this is, analytics is meant to just increase the understanding of sports, right? It's not meant to, to destroy the joy of any fan that's out there that sometimes is portrayed. 
Yeah, so looking at this from a little bit of a different angle, then what do you think is the responsibility of a journalist or a reporter or a writer to understand some of these analytic concepts to maybe avoid, you know, spewing narratives and talking about things that, you know, would be pretty easily debunked otherwise? I mean, obviously, people have different educational backgrounds and different interests, but do you think there's a responsibility to know some of that stuff? And do you think that's going to come and we're going to see a change with the way reporters work in that way? Well, I think if you're covering the game on a day in and day out basis and you don't know this stuff, you're cheating yourself. You're probably cheating your, your readership as well. Um, you can shine a lot of light down a dark hallway by uh, spending the time to, to get up to speed on a lot of things. You know what? And, and okay, it started with courses, but now you got people doing zone entries, uh, quality of competition, things that came in a little bit later. And, you know, we're still just scratching the surface too. I mean, I can think of a lot of things that I would like to see, you know, so some people take some deep dives into and that I think could, could shed some light on, on what's going on. So I think absolutely any, anything that, that enables you to take a snapshot of what you saw, if you're, you know, whether you're writing a game story or a notebook, or a feature story, or you're trying to explain why a guy's having a career year, or why this guy's playing better uh, under this coach than he did under the previous coach, why a guy like Ovechkin is having a year that uh, across eras is maybe better than a guy like Lemieux had uh, 20, 30 years ago. You, you, every, everything's, you know, it's contextual. And any anything that helps you put those things in their proper places. And, and that's important too, because you can, you know, the, the old Mark Twain saw uh, lies, damn lies and statistics. I mean, yeah, to a degree that's true, but if, if you shine the light the right way, uh, you can absolutely illuminate people. And I think that, that that's, I mean, we all grew up reading different sports writers and, and it, there's something really satisfying about reading about a game, whether you saw it or not, um, when, when somebody just a turn of a phrase or something, and, and it can, can include numbers that just turns on a light for you and makes you see something or understand something a little bit better than, than you did previously. Um, and I, I feel like, I mean, that's all how we got to where we are now. Um, just growing up, having a newspaper spread on the floor and just reading everything, it all adds up and, and you, you, it adds to your enjoyment and love of the game. And here we are. Yeah, I think ultimately, in some ways, the question comes down to how good you want to be at your job, right? Yeah. I mean, your your job, uh, if you're a beat reporter or uh, writing game story or whatever, is to to describe what happened. And uh, I, I think we've come a long way, and they're at a pretty good point in terms of descriptive uh, analytics. You know, I think there's obviously tons of work to be done there, and tons of work in in terms of predictive, but in terms of descriptive, what actually happened, we're at a, a pretty good point uh, in, terms of, in terms of understanding what we might have just seen and you know what, uh, who dominated whom, who got lucky, this, that, and the other thing. And we're also at a point in, in media where you're not just waiting until the paper's on your stoop the next morning and getting one version from the newspaper of what happened in the game last night. Right. I mean, you can go to any number of sources, get any number of, um, you know, highlights, descriptions of what happened in the game. So I, I do think that it's important that, uh, you know, those described in the game understand what's happened in the game. I mean, there's absolutely uh, something to be said for uh, for the narratives that are you know, part of sports and part of what people really do love about sports uh, in a lot of ways, sort of the romanticizing of and everything. But, you know, that's maybe what columnists are for. Uh, but in terms of actual beat reporting, I think it's important that they uh, get a grasp. I mean, if you don't, if you don't understand it, it's like, uh, like Twitter, you know, it's coming, it's here. If, if you choose not to uh, be a part of it, you're going to be left behind. Yeah. And I think, um, James Myrtle is probably one of the best in terms of being this journalist 2.0, right, that covers any sort of game. I mean, he really 
I, I don't know of any other writer that does a great job of covering a game, right? Covering the narrative, putting the narrative in context, and then backing it up with stats all in a way that's so accessible, pretty much anybody can understand it. I mean, that to me is the gold standard of what the sports journalist will be, you know, five years from now. I mean, it's now, but I'm saying like just in terms of just getting all those pieces together, he really is the best at it. And, you know, like JP said, I mean, this technology is coming. We've, we've heard about the changes in that's coming for the NHL. There's, you know, look at what basketball has done in terms of their data set and what they're able to provide. And just like we see in baseball and basketball where they're tweeting heat maps and they're tweeting all these other next-gen type stats, the NHL is going to do the same. And that's going to force anyone covering the game to be familiar with it because they're going to need to understand what technology is available. And like I said, I mean, it's, it's only going to, we're only going to get more data. We'll never go back to the point where we have less data to deal with. We're going to have more data. Some of it's going to be useful. Some of it we may think is useful at the beginning that we may learn is not so useful at the end, right? We saw that with the scoring chances. Some of you are probably familiar with tracking the scoring chances. And, I did for the Caps for almost a year and a half, and it just wasn't showing us enough to, to justify the return on energy. And, but being able to accept that, being able to understand why that is, and being able to understand its importance in context of the game is what anyone that's covered the game, right? It doesn't matter if you're a blogger or a journalist or in the broadcast field. I mean, this, this technology is just going to get better and better. The data is going to be more robust, and there'll be a palatable lack of understanding on your part if you're not able to at, at the very least understand it and disseminate it in some way. And if you don't see when a team that you're covering on a daily basis is on like a massive PDO bender or something and just you know you're getting they're getting routinely outshot but they're getting the saves or they're you know shooting an unsustainably high shot percentage and you know, this happens seven, eight games in a row or something. You are off writing the silliness about how they're defying. Uh, it, well, you're probably not even recognizing the, the, the data. I mean, the chemistry is there. Everybody's pulling on the rope, this, that, and the other thing. Then suddenly the bottom falls out. You know, do you look like a, somebody who's doing their job well covering the team? Or as this is happening, you say, despite <laughs> being outshot you know they, they're they're they've had a remarkable hot, remarkably hot goalie it's probably not sustainable this and the other thing so when it comes around you know but people i mean a lot of fans don't want to hear that it's coming going to come around and i think that's where analytics really has the advantage it's in the it's in the extremes right i mean that the gray area we still have a little bit of trouble with but for teams that are really struggling or teams that are really doing well we've shown as a group that we can pick which playoff teams are for real, which teams should make the playoffs the following season. And that's been some of the most contested debates in terms of media, right? It was Colorado, it was Minnesota, it was Toronto. I mean, you know, and Toronto was kind of the, the, the big one. I mean, that was where the, the rubber met the road in terms of Toronto has made it, big hockey market, they're going to be awesome. And, Analytics types were like, hey, let's pump the brakes a little bit because there's a lot going on here that makes them susceptible. And it ended up, you know, we as a group were right. But that to me is the key of analytics right now, is that we're really good at the extreme. The new day that's coming probably gets us a little bit better in the gray area. But for right now, if you're a journalist or if you're someone covering the team, if you can't recognize those extremes for what they are, you know, extremes, then like JP said, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make you look a little foolish. So let's say I'm your editor and it's the Stanley Cup Finals and I assign you a story to write on a, an unnamed fourth liner, we'll say. That would never happen. <laughs> <laughs> I assign you to write a story on a fourth liner who has 12 goals on 30 shots in the playoffs and who suffered some kind of trauma in the year before. Maybe he had somebody in his family pass away and he was dealing with a lot. And he says, write a feature on how great of a story this guy is and how he's coming into his own. What would you do knowing the fact that, you know, this probably isn't something that's going to continue into next season. He's still probably just going to be a fourth liner. But you still obviously, you know, it is a good story that he's having success after suffering hardship. How would you go about writing the story, wanting to 
get the story across and make it a good read, but not wanting to mis- misrepresent what type of player he is and, and his chances for future success. Well, I would first read the, uh, the stories about him being nominated for the master. <laughs> <laughs> And then, <laughs> and then once you're done, curiosity. Oh. Uh, yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, I think you'd have to be balanced about it. You'd have to say, well, you know, this guy, uh, this is where he was. This, this is the, this is the, the six years in the league that preceded this, this top playoff run. Um, this is his age. These are, you know, realistically speaking, the odds of this guy having a, a career epiphany. I mean. We've seen it here. We've seen Joel Ward score 25 goals at the age of 33. Uh, we've seen Jason Shamara score 20 goals at, I don't know if he was 34 or something. Those are two of the later, in, in, in terms of age, first 30 goal se- or 20 goal seasons we've seen in history. Yeah. Um, but we, you know, we knew those, those weren't really going to be repeatable. And, and Ward especially, the, the shooting percentage was, was abnormally high from uh, probably the second half last season in the first 10 20 games of this season and as as you could have predicted and any anyone could have it, it's leveled off and, and we all knew that that was coming so yeah i think that that's kind of how you do it. i mean 12 would you say 12 goals on 30 yeah. shots that's <laughs> that's that's i think john bruce would envy that, that sort of <laughs> that, that's that's exactly the guy that i was thinking of uh when, when he came up because uh i mean you write a piece i guess that we caveat it with this isn't sustainable stuff, but at the same time, you know, John Drews's run that year is, is legendary. And, you know, that's part of just locally. No, I mean, that's part of what makes sports fun in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, different people get different things out of sports, but, you know, legendary performances from guys you don't expect them from, they can still be enjoyable, even if they're not repeatable or, skill driven or any of that you know if you're just sitting there and watching it as a fan if you're not a you know just coldly analyzing things if you're an actual emotionally invested fan uh which i think most of us probably are or were at some point uh because probably wouldn't be that interested in sports if we weren't uh you know that's enjoyable it's great i I wouldn't take everything away from it and i i mean i guess that's probably some of where uh, uh, less analytically inclined fans think that uh, that stats may be taking some of the enjoyment out of the game, but you know the reality is that that stats, you know, it, whether the data is coursey or whether the data is home runs, you know, this is everything. My dad, you know, he grew up in the Bronx, and uh, you know, he told tell me growing up about. Uh, I was, him and his friends would just have these Mantle or Mazer Snyder arguments, and my dad could recite, you know, every stat that Mickey Mantle had. You know, th- these are these stats or these narratives. You know, they're they're part of what makes sports important. So I wouldn't want to, uh, you know, take everything out of them. Just you understand what's going on, and maybe it helps your enjoyment of it. But I wouldn't want to uh, just completely disregard something that's happening because then you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, I mean, it's not an either or. I think that's part of the issue. Part of the issue is either you have to buy into the narrative or you have to be into the stats and analytics. And that's not what the word is. I mean, and it's for me, like if my editor came to me and said that, one, like I said, that wouldn't happen. But two, they would say, hey, they, you can put stuff in context, right? I mean, I guess that's maybe where the Washington Post does things well, because they'll have somebody like a columnist kind of put it into this whole narrative of his upbringing and how good it's been. And then they'll ask me to come in with the hammer and be like, Hey, is this sustainable? Or is this, you know, what exactly are we seeing? And you know, you kind of get the best of both worlds, but you know, even if they did come to do that, then why can't you celebrate the <laughs> Drew life run with the caveat of, Hey, this may not last, but so what it's already happened. No one can take away that 10 goal, 30 shot performance from the player, from you as a fan. They can't take away that joy that you saw, that you had when you watched that, right? I mean, and if it doesn't continue, so what? You don't think it's gonna continue in? I mean, who cares? I mean, it's not like we're saying, don't enjoy that moment. That's what sports is, enjoy the moment, but here's what could happen. I mean, this is, this is something that is also 
going to be a part of the marriage fabric, right? He may go into a 0 for 30 slump. He may get another two goals. He may get the game winning. No one really knows, but that doesn't mean that we're trying to discount the performance. It's just trying to put it in some context. The performance also resulted in a sweep in the conference final. Yeah, yeah. If you're into that sort of thing, sure. <laughs> Um, so before we end off, I want to, uh, this is probably mostly for Neil, but you guys can chip in as well. Uh, do you find there's any internal resistance to using analytics from editors in terms of <laughs> there any problems with you selling that kind of writing? I mean, that's what I do. I mean, this position was created specifically for sports analytics, right? This, my position was actually created by Jeff Bezos when he bought the paper. He went to the, the East Department and said, you know, what do you want? Here's what we think we should have. And uh, it just was right place, right time. So I mean, that's my job. My job is to, to do sports analytics. Um, you know, it, so they, they're probably quite happy that I do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I'm lucky. I mean, they support just about everything that I write and every crazy idea that I have. Um, so yeah, I mean, they, they would want me to do more of it. I'm my own editor. I just <laughs> what I what I write about, they've never once in, in 20 years told me we want you to write about this or hey, could you could you do this? It's you know whatever I whatever I feel like. I'm lucky. Yeah, I presume JP is similar <laughs> similar control. <laughs> um, another question is um, how you account for the fact that people have different levels of knowledge uh, in analytics when you write a piece. So you know this kind of applies for all of you, but if you're mentioning uh, course or something or your shot attempts in an article uh, do you struggle sometimes with do I re-explain this concept do I link to something do I just leave it and presume they know what I'm talking about or how do you account for that that's a good question I mean I, I, I kind of I'm at the point now where I, I feel like most people are going to know what that kind of stuff is I mean I wrote baseball for a long time too on the side it's in, a, in a freelance capacity and for a long time you'd have to write out in parentheses like in you know what ops was and then at, at a certain point you're just like they know right. you start seeing it on broadcasts and stuff you figure people know and now you're starting to see it you're starting to see it on tv you're starting to see uh hockey broadcasting corporate and that kind of stuff so i think we're we're at the point where and, and me i probably have to to dumb it down a little more than 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 you guys do because somebody's reading neil they're going there for exactly that somebody's reading JP, they, they know what to expect. They're going there for exactly that. So I probably have to keep it a little simpler than, than you guys do. But, uh, you know, I think we're getting to the stage now where, you know, this stuff is is pretty understood and, and it's here to stay, obviously. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely something that uh, we sort of struggle with. Uh, you know, I, I think we still largely write out shot attempts, uh, you know, just a quick explanatory note because it's, you know, it's just a couple words and you know I think I tell our writers a lot of times assume that your uh, readers don't really know this stuff you know in a table you know we could write CF percent and probably most people would understand it but we usually put the little key at the bottom of it anyway and uh, you know I, I think that you want to bring people along like we were saying earlier like make it accessible uh, um, without dumbing it down so if it doesn't clutter it and if it doesn't uh, detract from where, where you're going with it. I think that still probably useful, especially with the league um, coming in and renaming everything. And uh, <laughs> which I, I, I personally don't have a problem with. I, I, uh, Corey had asked me, uh, Corey Massack with uh, NHL.com asked me, asked a bunch of people, a bunch of people in this room, I think also for input as they were developing this, uh, uh, their new stats advanced stats or whatever they want to call it uh system that you know whether to rename or not rename and i know that that it was a pretty divisive question and it does sort of forget uh or screw over or whatever words you want to use the some of the the uh, trailblazers on this stuff but you know again in the interest of expanding and accessibility you know shot attempts is just going to be more widely understood and accepted than Courses. Yeah, I have, I write everything out. I, I link to definitions also because I never, I don't know in advance when something of mine is going to be in print and if it's in print, it needs to explain what it is. So I, I'm constantly 
either giving a short definition or linking to a longer definition. Um, even though I think, like Mike said, that the readers that come to me typically know what they're in for. Sometimes I ambush people on this one, but for the most part, I do need to provide some definition. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, as far as like the renaming of stuff, I know you and I have talked about this for a while. The Corsi name was very clunky, and I, I don't want to say that it kind of held back the the analytics revolution in hockey, but it did make it a little bit more challenging. Right? I mean, it's much easier when these these names are intuitive, and even now finding out well, what we do PDO doesn't really stand for anything. Corsi was a was a farce, right? I mean, it, it was um, because of his mustache. Yeah, it wasn't even made up. Yeah. So you know my. My legacy to these is probably that my cat's pissed because now I got to call him shot attempt instead of course. <laughs> but, I think uh, also some of these names um, have been used as as proxies for things, and uh, you know we we'll, we refer to possession metrics. Uh, uh, you know when we were talking about shot attempts, and and they're, the shot attempts are a good proxy right. for uh, possession, but they're not possession. Correct. Uh, um, so, you know, I think that the, the more precise in language, you know, you take another example when you talk about like uh, zone starts, uh, which I know we're, we're going to be talking about later today. You know, you look at a guy's uh, offensive zone start uh, percentage and you see a guy at 60% and so, wow, this guy's getting 60% of his starts and, and, and that, that's imprecise language. Right. You know, what we're really talking about is the percentage of uh, shifts that start on a face-off, so dumping out all sh shifts that start on the fly. We're talking about uh, non-neutral zone, uh, which we're learning is even more important now. And right, and, and you know, and uh, obviously five on five is is generally what we're talking about. So in reality, the guy that's getting sixty percent, you know, sixty percent of his <coughs> zone starts in the offensive zone is probably down around you know twenty-five to thirty. percent percent maybe of his uh, so you know I, I think that we could be more precise in language and I think that, that was not at all the question you know they asked here but <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> but, but out of all this like I know JP and I have gone back and forth quite a bit on zone starts right I mean we've we've talked about zone starts probably more than anything else except for maybe the wire but <laughs> I mean you know, when you, when you talk about definitions, right, when you, you define it and you see a 60% number, but then you really look at it and it's maybe 30% of starts, and then you look at the raw number, and it's maybe like three shifts a game where the, the zone starts to happen, and then how much impact does that have? I mean, so, you know, being able to, to talk the same language, but also actually talk about what you're talking about, right, in terms of offensive start percentage, meaning exactly that, how many times he does it, but then able to tie it back. I mean, all that's important conversations to have. And I think calling it shot attempts, calling it you know, what they are, will help facilitate those types of so Because like I said, we're gonna have a next, next wave of statistics, which will actually be all that other stuff that we can't, well, hopefully all that other stuff that we can't quantify right now. So we're gonna need to start calling it what they are to avoid the truth. Yeah, I mean, to add on to zone starts, too, I only found out a couple months ago that it's not even actual zone starts. It's just the face-offs that that player takes yeah. in the number of zones when they calculate it. Way to keep up, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't have admitted that. But uh, anyway, I want to thank our panelists so much for being here today and taking the time out of their busy day. Thanks so much. I thought there was questions. Those were the questions. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was from the audience. Amazing what you can do.